So we're at a different location today. We're at my sister's place here at the most easterly point in Australia. And it looks like spring has come a bit early. So what we're gonna to do today is have a look at this hive and we might even get in there, have a look at the flow frames up close and see what the bees are doing to them. What are you seeing as far as the nectar flow goes here? It's really taken off in the last few weeks. Um, so we've had all the, the native tuckaroos blooming and so the bees have just been all over that pollen and that nectar. Um, I've even got a, a wattle tree in the back garden that I found some bees on the other day. Um, so I'm just gonna give them a, a few gentle puffs of smoke just to calm them down. Um, and so about th just over three weeks ago, I put uh, three new flow frames in. And if you come around this side, let's start with the back, you can see that they're bringing in this beautiful light flavored honey here. So these three, three frames here were empty about just over three weeks ago. Um, and so I think it's mostly Tuckaroo. We've also probably got some Melaleuca blooming locally as well over the, over the ridge. And you took some beautiful slow motion of the tuckaroos um, being feasted on by your bees. And uh, it's amazing the shots you get. So at some stage, if you'd show us those shots of your bees actually on the flowers that are making this honey, that'd be super good. Yeah, I can do that. I've got my phone just here. I don't know if we can ask. So if you've got questions, put them in the comments below. Wow, look at that. Collecting from the Takaru flowers. You can hear the tree alive with the buzz. And so they were collecting nectar and pollen. You could sort of smell the nectar in the air. Look at that. <laughs> Amazing, isn't it? So that's the, the flowers that the bees have been collecting the nectar from, bringing it all back to this hive here and making that, that uh, coloured honey here. So I can't wait to taste it, but today we're not going to be actually harvesting. I thought we'd leave it a little bit longer. And what might be more interesting is to do an, an inspection of the flow frames and just show you what it looks like up close. And of course, answer your questions, put your questions in the comments below, we'll get to answering those. And also let us know what's going on in your area, whether you're seeing honey coming in. It's winter time here in Australia, but on the coast here, we do get some good honey flows in the winter. Hasn't started working at my place, but at my sister's place here, it is uh, showing a good nectar flow already. So we're probably gonna see an early spring in these coastal areas of Australia and um, probably in early spring in general. So, um, but if you're in the Northern Hemisphere, it'd be interesting to know how it's going for you, whether you've got a, uh, a good nectar flow over there as well. Peter, can you show us what you might be looking for in ready frames to harvest? So if you have a look here, you can see that this frame is filling. You see the honey is actually building up. They've been dehydrating their nectar and it's not all the way out to the edge of the frame yet. If you come across to this frame here, you can see that they've filled up the cells completely and they're just starting to put their capping on. So when you see them putting their capping on the cells all the way down here, then that's when it's time to harvest. This frame is completely full of a darker honey and this frame is full on this side, but not here. Typically the extremities of the hive, they will leave till last. So this corner of the hive, they haven't started filling yet because they've still got a bit to fill up in the hive. If you come around to this side, you can get an idea of what it looks like. And there's so many bees in here, you might not even be able to see it until we pull one of those frames out. But when you see lots of bees like this, that's when you get a lot of honey being stored if you have a good nectar flow. So you can see down through the bees, perhaps down in this corner here, you can see the, uh, the beautiful uh, comb they're building onto the flow frames, filling it with nectar, dehydrating it, and making the amazing thing we call honey. It won't be long, to, they're gonna start capping it soon, I think. I think we'll find some capped on the other side of that frame. 
So it's amazing to watch them. It's been, what, just, uh, just over three weeks and they've made all of that honey and made all of that progress in the middle of winter here. It's incredible. I was not expecting them to um, kind of boom this early in the season. Um, I had a second hive and I did an inspection and there was six frames of cap brood and I thought, oh, <laughs> spring is here. Um, so that's an older frame that they had actually eaten some in the winter months and they've started finishing capping that end bit now. Oh, you'll get one of those two-tone honeys. Sometimes when the bees get hungry and they eat the, uh, the honey out and then they refill it with a different type of honey, you'll actually get two-tone honey in your jar swirling together, perhaps a, a red or brown honey and a really light yellow one all swirling together. That's uh, quite a cool thing. Just going to put on my bee suit. As usual, make sure you protect yourself from stings, not like my sister Mira here, who uh, is pretty relaxed around the bees. But um, I'm trying to set a good example here, so make sure you have your bee suit on, your gloves at the handy, especially if you're new to beekeeping. It's, it's not fun uh, getting surprises, so make sure you get comfortable before you start experimenting with not wearing a shirt <laughs> with long sleeves. Um, even the veil, um, it's really only for lightweight protection because the bees can get up underneath it if, yeah. if they want to. For me, I, you know, these are my bees and I know them very well. I know that they're an incredibly docile and calm colony. Um, and for me, I think the main thing is um, I really don't like being stung on the face, <laughs> um, but I, uh, I can handle being stung on my arms and legs. But again, this colony is incredibly gentle and I know them very well, so I'm not too worried. I usually be kept without gloves, just because I find I can be more gentle. So what we're doing is just taking off this inner cover. There's a bit of cinnamon powder up here because Mira had some ants uh, making a home up here. Yeah. So she's used that as a bit of a deterrent. And um, we're just going to get in there. The bees have actually stuck it together quite well here. There we go. Yeah, I haven't, I mean, I haven't opened this super for three and a half, three and a bit weeks. So we're just going to get around. They look like they're pretty busy the way they're um, gluing everything up. We're probably going to get a little bit of comb under this inner cover by the feel of it. Because there is a lot of bees. Might want to get the smoker ready. Sometimes it's a nice idea just to whiff a bit of smoke under the lid as you take the inner cover off. Okay. They have just started to connect it, but there's not a whole lot of comb above the flow frames there. Now, you often talk about us looking for the queen on the inner cover, but because the inner cover is now on top of the super and there's a queen excluder, then there won't be a queen up here. So we don't need to worry too much about that. But it's still a nice idea to put it at the entrance so those bees can walk home. Okay, so some tips here on how to get your flow frames out. So there's a, um, there's a few things to consider and we might actually add a little bit of smoke here as well just because there's so many bees we don't want to roll them as we get the frames out. Now we might start here in the centre. doesn't matter so much where you start with the flow frames. Notice they've been connecting a bit of burr comb between the frames. So what I'm going to do is cut that away just with a chisel end. Now, because I'm pulling out this frame here, I'm going to slice along the other frame so that burr comb comes with it because you don't want it staying there and dragging along the comb surface as you pull it out. And we're gently putting the bees out of the way. If you've got any questions, put them in the comments. We're here each week to help answer your questions as you get started. Wow, they put a lot of wax in between the frames here. Some hives will and some hives won't. They are, they are a very propolizing and waxy hive, this one. 
Okay, we've got a question coming yeah. in. Cedar, um, Juliana, Juliana's asking, if you harvest a flow frame, uh, does it impact their ability to finish other frames or are they more likely to move to an empty one rather than finish the frame that you've taken out? That you've emptied, basically. Uh, if I get your question, um, basically, it, it's efficient to harvest a frame when it's full because the last 5% of honey will stay in the frame and then they'll use the, uh, the remaining bits to help finish off another frame, if you like. So um, it's a nice thing to, to, when you see them all capped down here, to harvest that, and even if the next one's not quite ready, and then they'll use the remaining bits, recycle the wax cappings even, to use on the adjacent frame. So it's slightly more efficient just to harvest every second frame than it is to harvest the whole lot at once. Um, so go for it and harvest away when you see a frame full. Great. Not sure if I answered your question, but clarify if I didn't. No, I think that's, that's good. Shannon's wondering, I'm not sure where Shannon is, but if they've taken off the flow hive during winter, should they wait till winter's over or put the flow hive back on? Um, if you're seeing your bees building up, and it depends on what area you are, if you're in those more subtropical regions with, uh, with a, a nectar flow starting and you might just have to watch your bees and see if they're getting really busy. If they're getting busy, you take the, uh, and ha have a peek in there and if they're storing honey in the frames, they're looking nice and full in the brood box, then you might want to put that super back on, give them some more space. If you're in the more southern areas, then uh, you might want to wait a bit longer till the spring actually comes. Okay. Now, in terms of getting the frames out, now this is a grey old day and these bees actually are getting a little bit um, annoyed with me. So what I'm going to do is top up my smoker because it's just about out of smoke. They're probably not used to me, you see, my system mirror yeah, that they're all good with. Yeah. Um, but apparently bees can recognise faces, which is pretty extraordinary when you think about how big their brains are. It's pretty amazing. They can also recognise Van Gogh over Dali in terms of artworks. There's been experiments done at, with tunnels and artworks and then when they've switched to different artworks from the same artist the bees have been still able to recognize which way is home even when they're switching them around pretty cool um, who knows how they do it but I'm just going to add a bit of smoke here get the smoker really going add a bit here And in terms of getting the flow frames out, I'll just show you how to do that. Now, typically I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't really, uh, it's not necessary to take the flow frames out before you harvest. You can get a really good idea by watching the honey flow, watching the windows and seeing when they're full. But if you want to, by all means get in there and have a look. So we're doing this for the purposes of the exercise today, even though we didn't really need to. Um, so. There's three lifting points to a flow frame. There's one under here. You can actually get right your tool right under here and give it a bit of a lift. There's one under there. And the J end can go under here. So I can lift like that. And then I've got that with my hand. And I've got the hive tool under the other end. Now what I'm going to do is gently come up and one little sting on the finger. I might need to put my gloves on. Yeah, let me smoke the sting. Uh, and uh, let me smoke the sting just to. And look at that, they're almost ready to harvest, which is what we could see from the outside as well. We could see they were almost ready. And they're just going to fill and cap that last little section in the middle there. 
Isn't that beautiful? It's such a nice, um, nice thing just to be able to watch in on this world and see what the bees are doing. You can see a couple drinking here and that's probably because we were adding smoke to the hive. That does tend to trigger them to start gorging themselves just in case there's a fire coming and they need to take off. But this beautiful shape of honeycomb and this beautiful light honey they're bringing in from the tuckaroo flowers. It is um, it's an amazing thing. I'm getting excited about the spring now. My hives aren't doing this yet, so it's nice to come and see Mira's hive here, bringing in that tuckaroo nectar. Look, you can even see the tongue there. Excellent. That is so cool. So it does get exciting when you've got a good honey flow and lots of bees in your hive and start really filling up the frames quite quickly. Most of the filling of these frames would have happened in the, in the last uh, couple of weeks. Frame's quite heavy. There's about three kilograms of honey in here. It's amazing how much they can store in a single frame. Can we see the end of that one, Cedar? So just matching up with what's happening on the end, you can see it's not quite ready on the end as well. see that they haven't quite capped and finished off that. So when we looked at the end, we, we could identify that that frame was, was nearly ready and now we've pulled it out and looked, we can see that that's an accurate assessment. They're working away on it right now, <laughs> filling these last bits in. They are too. And, you know, the fact is they're almost capping off that middle section. Can we get a macro mirror? Sure. In, in fact, you could, you, could, you could harvest this uh, frame now and you'd get honey that w would keep on the shelf, even though there's a portion of the frame that isn't actually quite ready. They're so close. Beekeepers will tend to take frames in the commercial sense if they're 70% capped. Wow, Cedar, we're getting great tongue in cell action here. We've got a few people asking us, Mira, what, what, ca what are you using to film these shots? Yeah, so... Let's just have a look at what Mira's using to get those shots of the bee's tongue. I've got a couple of different um, lens attachments that I use for my phone. Sorry, I don't have a mic on, so I'm just going to stand and talk near Cedar. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Mira. Um, so for that, those shots, I was actually using um, so an iPhone XS Max it's called a, a like stylus revolver lens, which has a little magne magnetized lens that has a macro that flips out. Um, I find I use this a lot on my regular phone because it's in my pocket. If I see a tree with bees on it, I can kind of instantly grab um, a shot and I always have it with me and it's very handy because you can kind of flip it out and close it. But I also use the uh, Moment lens and case. And so this is a macro prime lens from Moment. Um, this is a kind of higher quality glass and, and produces a better shot. And so if I'm doing a film shoot, I generally use this. Um, and I'm usually shooting on in slow motion to get, to get nice um, close up shots and allowing me to do it handheld. If I shoot in slow motion, it means that I can slow down that movement. Very get a nice smooth shot. Very neat. Some great tips there. Perhaps Mira, you could put some links in the uh, below. Yeah, sure. A bit later on. Absolutely. Okay. So. Oh, that's exciting that they're getting almost time to harvest. I really just want to like have a taste. Yeah, <laughs> could have a taste. In fact, one thing you can do with a frame is just crack the last cell line and taste it. If you're getting impatient, you can, uh, you can just crack that very last cell line and have a, stiff, a, a big spoon of honey from, from the last cell and they'll refill that quite quickly again. Okay. 
So you'll often find Mira out, out in the garden <laughs> obsessing over all sorts of bees, all sorts of native bees too. And it's a, um, most of the amazing images you see of the slow motion bees and the macro bees is Mira with her fascination out in the garden taking amazing shots. Yeah, it's a, it's a little bit of an obsession. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, keep the uh, questions coming in. If you've got questions, put them in the comments below. Meanwhile, I'll just run through how to put a frame back in. Very busy hive. If you have a look here, down in between these two frames, there's actually so many bees that I worry that putting the frame back in might actually squash some bees. So what I'm gonna do is actually smoke that area to vacate it of bees. Um, not completely, but enough to be able to slide the frame back in without squashing them. So I'll do that now. You notice the tune of the bees changes as you add your smoke. They kind of <laughs> it's even making me cough. <laughs> I know. <laughs> do you blame them? <laughs> Don't blame them, but it does make them wander off those frame surfaces. Yeah, and then you're less likely to. Although if you've got a lot of open honey, the smoke flavour will actually get into your honey. So something to be careful of. If you're, if you're going to be harvesting um, some almost ready honeycomb from your hive. Okay. Now, there's, um, there's another thing here. As you add the frame back in, there's just a tip to the last one. What I usually do is put this edge on first, make sure the bees are out of the way. And that way I've got my frame spacing. The last one can be quite tricky sometimes. And then I roll the other end in and down. And if you have an assistant, you can get them to just put a little bit of smoke in that end so we don't squash any bees on that bottom edge. That's why you always take that window the wooden window out of when you pull out the flow frames. Good tip. Take the window out when you're pulling out and putting back the flow frames. Otherwise, you might not know there's a pile of bees here. As this comes down, you don't want to squash any. Great, so that's frames back in, hives back together. We don't really need to go and pull out all the flow frames. It's just really interesting to get in there and have a look. As you learn about your bees, you'll learn what the image looks like here and what is happening in the hive and that way you can gauge when's a good time to harvest. Make sure you're getting a nice low moisture content honey that will keep on the shelf. In the end you want honey that's under 20% moisture content and then it will uh, be much less likely to ferment and it should keep for a long time provided you keep the lid on the jar. Cedar, a couple of people asking just why you've got that super that it's looking so f packed. Would it be ready to split or would you attach another super to it or just leave it as it is? I think certainly it would be a really good idea to um, either give these bees some more space or split them. I tend to like to keep running them like this and splitting. That's because I like to build up hives and I'm constantly giving hives away. And uh, so I would tend to take a split, but um, other people tend to um, add another box to give them some more space. You can either add another brood box or you can add another super. Generally I find a single brood box is enough area for the queen to lay and have a big population. Uh, there is enough cells in there if you count them all up for a hive with a single super. However, different beekeepers have their different theories on why and they might um, decide to add a second brood. It's um, really up to you and your strategies of what you want to do. My preference is to take a split and if you don't want that split then somebody else really will and you'll be helping them by getting them started in beekeeping. Yeah, so I've got a few friends at the moment that are wanting to start beekeeping. So my plan for this hive will probably be to um, wait a few more days to a couple of those frames of cat so I can harvest and taste some of that honey. And then I'll probably look in the brood nest and depending on what I find, I may create a split. And that would be... I wasn't expecting to do a split this early, but... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> it's, yeah, it's astonishing how quickly they've started building up. Fantastic. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I'll have a happy friend who gets a beehive. We will be um, showing you live how to split hives as the season progresses. But if you want to get a jump on that, we do have videos showing you how to take a split. And we also have the beekeeper.org, which is a, a, uh, a new initiative we've put together with a lot of really high quality online training content in a useful order with experts from all around the world. It's free to try if you want to check that out as well. And uh, you can, you can uh, learn, learn a lot. In fact, I'm learning a lot from uh, the experts around the world as well. So um, it's a fantastic thing. But um, there's also videos on our YouTube channel and Facebook page of taking splits in the past if you want to learn about that. Michael's uh, called in from New York, Cedar, and put the super on a few weeks ago. The bees just don't seem to be yet sort of going up into the super. Just wondering if you've got any good tips on that. Ah, uh, yes. Um, if you dial back a few videos in our Facebook live stream, probably about four or five, you'll see me scraping some comb off the top of the brood frames, just some burr comb that's sitting on top, and just with the hive tool mashing it into the face of the flow frame. And what that can do is the, stimulate the bees to get going and they'll actually use that wax and recycle it on the area. So if you do it in the window of the hive, you'll get to watch that. However, if there's no nectar flow, then your bees won't actually build up and start uh, uh, using the frames. In fact, if there's no nectar flow, they'll shrink down and shrink down and use the frames less and less. But as the nectar flow comes on, your population starts to build, the queen's laying more, then when you have a lot of bees in your hive and that coincides with the nectar flow, they'll start filling them. I rarely put any wax on the flow frames at all. In fact, pretty much never, only for demonstration purposes. But if you are getting impatient, scrape some comb off, mash it into the flow frame surfaces, and that will um, speed up getting some activity on your frames that you can watch. Great, Cedar, um, in regards to that smoky flavour, Marilyn's just called in from Bendigo and said that when they harvested their honey after the bushfires, it tasted really smoky. Wow, that's interesting. The bushfires were so bad here in Australia at the end of last year, that beekeepers were even getting smoky honey. That's um, <laughs> really interesting and I guess, you know, it's a bit of a delicacy. Make sure you save one of those jars. It was a pretty intense and horrific time and um, interesting to have some of that flavour in the honey. Yeah, oh, nice for cooking. A few people noticed um, mirror the cinnamon on top of your inner cover and just wondering, was that for the ants or the hive beetle? Um, yeah, that, that, was, that was for the ants. So um, I had a little bit of a problem when I moved this hive here, the previous location, I didn't have um, an ant barrier. So I had some ants building a nest in the roof and just to try and um, prevent them from continuing to build that nest, I placed some cinnamon, you can actually see it here. So um, it just really, that ants really, really dislike cinnamon. So it's a great way, natural way to, to help deter them. And, it, and it's worked, as you can see, there's no, no ants in there anymore. So maybe now the honey will be smoky and cinnamon smoky flavoured. Smoky and cinnamony. <laughs> cinnamon scroll. Yeah, I mean, what could go wrong? Smoky cinnamon honey on toast. <laughs> Katie's wondering where you are. She's saying it looks like New Zealand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not quite New Zealand here. Trace could probably verify that. She's from Wanganui in New Zealand. And um, it's just a little bit warmer here, but there is some beautiful places in New Zealand for sure that, that are a bit like this. Um, especially uh, in the, the, the northern areas of the South Island. Probably it's actually in, in Byron Bay. Byron Bay, Australia, most easterly point, although that's recently being debated by some people just down the road <laughs> who claim at Flat Rock at low tide that's the most easterly point. So like anything, whether it be beekeeping or not, there's always a bit of controversy. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew's wondering, do the bees get more agitated when the hive is packed and ready to split? 
Um, certainly you can find that a bigger colony is more agitated, but it's probably more so that there's just more bees. So if there's a bit of agitation, that gets amplified by a lot of agitation. But as you can see, um, you can, can also have a friendly colony and there's Mira getting around with, without um, a bee suit on and finding it no problem standing right in front of the entrance. Um, yeah, see, they're my bees. They like me. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, my sister, they like my sister, whereas they stung me. They stung you. <laughs> so so uh, I guess um, it's about learning about the bees. If you're unsure, then wear your bee suit, wear your gloves. If, if I had been wearing my gloves, I wouldn't have gotten a sting on my finger. <laughs> Fantastic. A couple of people just, um, I guess, said asking about the queen excluder because, like, wondering is the queen up there or how do you keep the queen below the brood box? So, the queen excluder is a grid of bars that are 4.3 millimetres in spacing. And a worker bee can get through there no problem, but a queen can't. So, it was a clever invention to keep the queen from laying in your honey supers. And it works very well. The queen stays down there, like babies down below, and the workers can get through and store honey up the top. Now, some people decide not to run an excluder, and some people do that with flow frames as well. And it seems to be very queen specific. Well, one queen will lay eggs in the flow frames, another won't. And I've seen amazing examples of that where, in fact, the hive right outside my door hasn't run a queen excluder for years, but I'm expecting the queen to be superseded at some stage soon because she's been around a while now. And um, I've seen a situation where I've had a hive for years, no queen excluder, never an issue with bees laying in the flow frames. And then one day I just happened to be standing there while they dragged the queen out. She had been superseded. Three, four weeks later, the new queen was laying in the flow frame. So that was quite a shining example of its very genetic or queen specific whether laying will happen in the flow frame. So if you are experimenting with no queen excluder, then make sure you inspect your flow frames just like we did then. Make sure she isn't a queen that's going to lay brood in your flow frames. But otherwise, most people just run an excluder to take out that issue and it comes with the hive. Just a little black uh, line here between these two boxes is the queen excluder. Cedar, how often would you harvest um, in winter compared to the summer months? So it really depends and uh, it's, you can get a season with no honey at all. And in fact, many people in Australia have just experienced that. The fires, it was so dry at that time that a lot of the, the species of, of trees and plants decided not to flower at all. And what that means for your bees is you won't get any nectar collected, or not enough to really put on a, a, enough honey to share with us. So, um, so it really does depend and what you need to do is, is just observe when you see a, a lot of honey being stored, that's a good time to harvest as soon as they're putting their cap capping on. And when you see them eating the honey away from the windows, leave it for the bees. If you're unsure, you can even just harvest one frame or a part of, the, part of a frame just by putting your key in a little way and turning it. And you can harvest just a part of a frame and still get to taste and enjoy some of the flavours they're bringing in without, uh, and making sure there's enough left for your bees. So. There's a good little tip there if you're unsure. Cedar, just how hard do bees have to work to fill a flow frame? Bees are, are extraordinary. It's, it, when you start doing the maths, it's wild. If you've got a hive like this with 50,000 bees and half of them go out to forage, that'd be 50 million flowers they could visit. It, that's if, if each foraging bee can, can visit 2,000 flowers in a day, which apparently they can even visit more. 50 million flowers for a hive like this, that's just unbelievable. And uh, if you add up all of the bee flight to do that in a day, it's actually more than twice around the world, depending on how far the flowers are away. So it's, it's um, insane how hard these little 
creatures can, can actually work. And that's how come the humans have dragged them all around the world wherever they go. The honeybee and the humans have been traveling together for a long time because they're such good pollinators. And they're so intertwined now with our agriculture that if, if the honeybees disappeared, we would actually see drastic effects. You'd see a third of the food types disappear off the supermarket shelves straight away. And then of course, bigger issues to come beyond that if we're losing our pollinators. So, um, so important and it's amazing how hard they work. And it's, it's, there's no other insect that can store food like this. In fact, I think it's one of the, the only insects that actually produces food we can eat. And they produce such an incredible amount of it. One of these frames, it will fill a whole lot of jars and if you, if you uh, harvest all of these frames then if you get like a typical honey jar you might have 40 or 50 of those jars just from this box and then the bees can work so hard in a, in a good spring flow a couple of weeks later filled it all up again so it's exciting when that happens and I've seen it many times and hopefully in your in your beekeeping you'll get to see that too. How far will they be travelling cedar to collect this, the, to get their nectar? So typically bees will stay within say a three kilometre, a couple of mile radius. And if they're hungry, they'll go up to 10 kilometres or six miles. That's a long way for, for bees to fly with their tiny little wings, but they'll do that if they're hungry. But typically uh, they'll stay within that um, three kilometre radius and that's where they'll do most of their foraging. Now here we're on a bit of a um, uh, peninsula that sticks out into the ocean. So it's surprising that they're doing so well here because if you think about that, the bees are right out here at the tip and most of the pie they're missing out on. It's just ocean, there's no, no nectar out there. But we're in a forested region, they're finding plenty of flowers still. Great, Cedar. Um, someone's just spotted, is that the bees that have just made a little chew on the front of your entrance of the hive there? That shot. Yeah, I was asking Mary about that earlier. That was here, I think, they're asking on the inner cover. So at some stage, the inner cover must have been propped up with some sticks on top of a brood nest and they've been using it as an entrance and perhaps it wasn't quite wide enough and the bees were starting to chew. They can actually chew wood. Oh, you were talking about down here. Look at that. Yeah, so bees can chew wood if they want to, but it's pretty slow, so over time they can gradually chew away at it, just Thank with you. their mandibles at the front. We've got time for a couple more questions. Oh, can and we? Oh, my sister wants to have us. Oh. Wants to sneak a little bit of honey. Well, because when we looked at that frame, it was completely capped almost at the end. Right here. Yeah. Let's just have us a little bit of honey because so we can taste it. We can't wait. <laughs> this is what happens when we have a family affair because we've got Cedar and his sister Mira and Jai filming. So that's right. That's you can do anything's possible here. Family affair. Shout out to Jai behind the camera. Yeah. yeah. My nephew. It's okay. Be so out of the way. He uh, he's putting together many of the videos that you see and enjoy. So he's um, very talented behind the uh, editing suite. <laughs> yeah, we need to turn the camera around, Jai. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Michael's saying they've got canola flowering where, where, where they are and wondering what, the, what that honey would taste like, do you think, with canola? Oh, canola is a really light, um, light white kind of, um, crystallizes quite quickly, but it's a really yummy, yummy honey. Canola's. Yeah, canola. I've even seen it with a slight greenish tinge, which is unusual for honey. And um, it's a brassica. So it, it, I found that it actually had a little bit of that brassica flavor in it, which um, wasn't my favorite, I have to admit. But my favorite thing is to try lots of different types of honeys. Even if I don't particularly like it, I love to have it on the shelf because I can go taste this one, taste that one, taste this other one. One interesting thing with canola honey, which also gets called rapeseed, is it crystallizes quite quickly if the temperature drops. So if you, um, but what uh, flow hive beekeepers find is they can harvest it 
while it's still warm on the hive and it'll come out fine. But if you take the box off and take it away, which is a conventional practice, and that box of, of frames gets cold overnight, you'll find that the crystals will be start, starting to form. So beekeepers in the conventional fashion would take the uh, honey frames off the hive like they have to, to harvest, and will actually keep them warm so that that doesn't uh, crystallize between taking them off and spinning them in a centrifuge. So if you do have canola honey, then you might just want to harvest it um, when it's ready rather than leaving it sit in the hive because it might go candy eventually if you get some cold nights and particularly the outer frames. I'm gonna go ahead and tap this frame that we were looking at earlier. Um, are you sure your jar is big enough? Oh, I was just going to do a very tiny little bit. Okay, okay. Oh, just going to do a few frame, frame lines. <laughs> okay, so one thing you can do is just harvest a little bit. So, Although she could go and harvest the whole frame, um, she's just going to harvest a bit and keep all the honey for herself. Uh, no, I just want us to be able to taste it. <laughs> I'm really curious to see if it's... Um, so that, yeah, just sorry to tell you that that slides in. It's got a little bit of propolis, but... Um, the little leak back so when we're finished harvesting any any honey in the trough will leak back in there for the bees and so the flow tubes have that little lip let's make sure that little tongue goes at the bottom and poke it, it in and it kind of locks in and then we're really just going to put the key in sort of that much and turn a few frame lines otherwise we'll overflow our jar so okay <laughs> all right Put it into the which, bottom which slot. Which slot are you putting it in there, Mira? In the bottom slot right. is the bottom slot to open and the top slot to close. And so I've just just popped it in just a tiny bit. So I'm doing about four or five frame lines, and then I'm just going to brace it with one hand and turn it 90 degrees. And you can actually already see that cell lines opened. And we've got some honey flowing Ooh. already. See, so you mentioned a couple of times about the nectar flow. How do people know if there is a good nectar flow? So the best way to tell if there's a good nectar flow is by observing the windows on your hive. Now, conventionally in beekeeping, people used to just grab the hive and lift it and try and ascertain whether it was heavier than last time they lifted it, and they call that hefting. And it's still done today as the main method to tell whether your bees are putting on uh, honey or not. And uh, it's, um, it's a little bit easier to tell with the flow hive because you can actually view a cross section of the frame and watch as they fill the cells with nectar. And they go through this amazing process of splashing it around the cells and drying out that nectar. And, and um, look at that. Beautiful, that Takaru honey. Um, Moment of tree. Moment of tree. Hang on. <laughs> no, me first. Me first. <laughs> We've got the bee paparazzi going on well, here. Well, I don't have a bee suit on, so ah. mine's a bit easier. Okay. Oh, wow. That is an amazing honey. That is definitely got lots of Takaru. It smells like the flowers taste. That's interesting. I never connected that flavour with the Takaroos, so. There you go. We've got a, a, quite a pure Takaru flow, so we know what it tastes like. And it's really nice when that happens and you get to match up the flavour with the flowers. And over time you build up this kind of uh, repertoire of being able to know what the flavour, what the flower is that the bees have been foraging on to produce the honey. Of course, there's as many different flavours of honey as there are flowers that produce nectar in the world. So you won't know them all and you never will, but you'll know some of the key ones in your surrounding area, what they taste like, what the honey looks like, and the color of the honey, and you start to really know. And some of them are so strong, you get this amazing waft right through your house from your apiary as the bees really are, are drawing that out and producing a lot of, um, I guess, uh, <laughs> a lot of beautiful honey uh, scented air is fanning out from your hives and oh that's interesting I just saw one little globule did you see mm, that I did see that which possibly is a leptospermum which has uh, a, a jelly thixotropic 
a property and you can get a little bit of that during the winter here too so there might be there's a bit of kind of heath land over the back of the of the hill here so i wonder if they're getting into a bit of that so if you see a jelly like blob coming out then it's probably those leptospermum and flowers and they're very medicinal it's the australian manuka as it gets called Nice. Chloe's, Chloe's wondering and during winter if there's still a good nectar flow, how many frames should they leave in their flow hive? Okay. Full flow hive. So if you're seeing a good nectar flow then you don't need to leave any frames in your hive, they're still bringing it in. But if you're unsure then, then just have some and leave the rest. If you know there's a big flowering coming then you make some space in your hive, store some honey in the jars on the shelf, make some more space for them and they will get busy and start filling up those frames. Busy bees are happy bees. <laughs> Fred Dunn's just joined us. Hey Fred. He's, he's saying happy to see us in a different environment. Uh, hey Fred, we're <laughs> hey Fred. at my sister Mira's place in uh, the most easterly point in Australia. It's right out on the, on the actual peninsula under the lighthouse and um, we've got an early spring here it's been great to see. And this is the tuckaroo flowers. And we're just harvesting a small jar of honey because um, they actually haven't quite finished filling it up, but we can't wait to <laughs> test this flavor. I was too impatient. I wanted to try. Because the tuckaroos have been the main bloom at the moment, I can smell it in the air and I can smell that perfume from the flower. And so I really wanted to see if that was the flavor that we were getting in the hive. And um, it really is a very distinct how would you describe it flavor it's very light and sweet and fruity it almost like a slightly citrusy aftertaste for me it's like it's i think just, we might overflow it's, it's, it's just about <laughs> lolly shop a cup? i think yeah it's just about lolly shop in flavor it's amazing yeah might it's uh it's getting a bit close i think trace is gonna <laughs> back up jar back a, up glass here's a back up glass or was it too big well it's a bit big we could get a jar from upstairs so it's all right i'll just get jai to eat some fantastic so <laughs> shall i get one so um wow trace well, has just really gone to great. get isn't that amazing trace has gone to get another jar because we might have to start quickly eating it so <laughs> that it doesn't overflow i know even by putting the key in like like if let's have let's measure the key right yeah so the key's gone in that far and um that's going to be more than a little jar like that um Cedar, you're notorious for taking great big sips of honey. Hey, you don't, have to pull out that don't tell people that. <laughs> quick, Trace, quick. <laughs> I had to find the jar cupboard. And the moral, the moral to the story is always... Right. It's a little bit sticky. A little bit sticky, but... Is always make sure you have some Spare extra jars. jars. Yeah, don't be uh, so ambitious. And, um, oh wow, you can feel it's warm. Mm. In fact, I'm not even going to be able to fit the lid on that. That's <laughs> a beautiful flavour, and I think we just need to crack a little bit more so I can take some home. <laughs> hey! <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Yeah, we need some yeah, for the you office. Can have a sip. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> okay, so uh, we've got time for another uh, couple of questions. Couple of questions. <laughs> <laughs> if, if you're buying a flow hive, should you do anything to get your garden ready to, or um, the base where you're going to put your hive? Well, it's good to think about where you're going to put them, uh, put your hive or hives, because there's some considerations like where the bees are flying, make sure they're not bothering neighbours, etc. You want to have it in a spot where people don't usually walk past the entrance of the hive. So prepare a site. It's nice to have a little bit of a clearing out the front, although bees will work it out even if the foliage is right up against the hive, they'll still work out uh, their flight path, but they'll tend to come out and double back, so that's a consideration. In terms of your garden, it's not necessary to plant flowers, but it's a beautiful thing to do. You'll attract a whole lot of native pollinators. You will provide a little bit of nectar for your bees, but in a small backyard, it's hard to plant enough to really make a difference to your honey crop because the bees are incredible foragers and they'll be visiting 
uh, hundreds of millions of flowers to make this honey in this hive. So um, they do need to forage a long way. However, planting a, a beautiful garden is always a good idea. You'll learn so much about bees. You'll, you'll attract the, the native bees and it's um, fascinating to, to not only look at the European honeybees but all of the amazing species of the bee world that we actually really depend on to do the amazing pollination. What, what um, way is this hive facing? So this is facing to the north, which is typical for beekeepers here in the southern hemisphere is to face it to the north. That way you get some sun shining in the entrance and uh, it's not a bad thing to get some sun in the entrance in the morning, gets your bees up and going. However, it's not the most critical thing. It's more of a commercial beekeeper's thinking they'll face it north or northeast so that they get some sun in the entrance in the morning, wake up your bees earlier and get them working and producing honey earlier but there'll be other factors as a backyard beekeeper that you'll be considering before which direction your hive faces. Great, Abby's calling from upstate New York and she loves harvesting her honey with her daughters who are five and eight. So she's saying thanks so much for the flow hive. Excellent, um, excellent. Yeah, Roy Rogers, this is an interesting one. He's had multiple queens hatch at once. Um, they were. F they were wildly flying around the hive and then two of the queens sat on the landing board and one underneath. Was that, is that normal? No, um, <laughs> that's unusual and well done for being able to see that and spot that. Um, you're probably, probably in a situation where your hive is swarming and what happens when your hive swarms is half the bees will kick out the old queen and there'll be a new queen that the hives uh, raised or raising. So you'll get this situation where, where um, there is a moment where there's multiple queens in the hive and you'll actually see that. Um, I've seen it where you get two queens in a hive but it's unusual. And sometimes you can even get a swarm that has two queens in it, which is more unusual again. And you go through this crazy swarm catching um, episode where where the swarm you don't know where it's going it divides in two and then you end up with two swarms so um, bees will be bees and constantly full of surprises and there's so much more we need to learn about bees and there's so much more you'll learn along the way so well done for being able to spot that and interested to hear what happens with your two queens thank you very much for tuning in if you've got ideas on what you'd like us to cover we're here to answer your questions each week and hopefully that um, helps you get